in step now as they were then. All working as one as they were then. This commemoration of the Battle of the Atlantic, an annual plea to remember the names, the stories of the Second World War. Wayward. Lost with eight lives on February 22nd, 1943. Not all have been told, some have been locked away. Their keepers, the likes of 96-year-old Elsa Lassard, once ordered to keep them quiet. And for decades, she did. Many of her compatriots went to their graves saying nothing of their service. But Elsa now wants the world to know what the women who were the code breakers and the listeners did, because it was huge. The listeners around the world shortened the war by two years, at least and saved a quarter of a million lives. That's so incredible. that makes me feel pretty important and in good company. A few things to know about Elsa. Let me look at you. Oh, oh, th thanks, Elsa. <laughs> there aren't many like her. I'll do it. Oh, no, hang on. Let me do it. Oh, jeez, OK. I think and if people can be national treasures, well, she's one of Canada's. Voila. <laughs> wow. In that hefty Love bag of life. mementos, so her beautiful. war story. I was 22. 22? Just a kid. Young Elsa Lassard was one of 7,000 Canadian wrens. Those are members of the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service. Just as her brothers enrolled to fight, she stepped up too, but was tasked with a very different mission. I got my Morse code training, and then I was sent to Coverdale, and it had a bog, which is perfect for a reception. Just across the river from Moncton was where Coverdale was perched. That was the name for a signals intelligence post opened in 1944. The work was secret, the place staffed entirely by women trained to monitor German U-boat activity, intercept their messages back to Nazi Germany, and ensure they weren't heading down the St. Lawrence. These women were on the front line of breaking the German code, spent entire shifts listening for the tiniest, most distinctive sounds. I'm curious if you can take me into those headphones. Yes. Oh, it's noisy. All the shipping that's up and down the waters are forever uh, sending messages. It's called traffic. Mm -hmm. It's like this. Yeah. And you have to find your U-boat. What was that sound when you knew a U-boat was trying to communicate? It was called E-bar. So as soon as we got our U-boat, we hung in there and copied, and you just copied like mad in pencil. And as the supervisor went around, as she saw you getting towards the last of the van, they zipped it off the, the copy pad and sent it down the hall in a teletype operator, brrr, sent it off to England at Bletchley Park. What a famous name that is. Who are you? Alan Turing. Yeah, Turing. Yeah. A mathematician. Correct. Why do you... Bletchley Park. The crucial and covert government station in the UK where a team led by Alan Turing broke the Enigma code. That was the German encryption system. Breaking that code meant the Allies could figure out what the Germans were really up to. The 2014 movie, The Imitation Game, showed the world what Bletchley did and just how urgent it was that it all be kept quiet in those delicate days. Now for the hard part, keeping it a secret. Even the Bletchley outstations across the Atlantic, like Coverdale, and their workers, like Elsa, were under the same orders. At what point did somebody tell you your work is secret? All we know is that we were sworn to secrecy for at least 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> It was on pain of death. <laughs> you didn't think about it twice. <laughs> I can see her every day and talk to her or feel her, her gaze. 
The idea of staying silent about all those sounds they intercepted stuck with Canada's wrens. Isabel Arthur's mother was Lieutenant Sheila Mappin. Still had the hair of the time and the very determined look. Who always played down any questions about her service. Even 60 years at the time after when I would say, Mais maman, it would be great to know about it. And she felt that the national security was still involved and perhaps at risk if you talked. There they were at a picnic, but still in uniform wearing their tie. Information trickled out over the years in the most curious and subtle of ways. Isabel was an adult before the seriousness of it sunk in. I was in Montreal staying with her for a few days and we watched television and there was a, a show or a movie on, I don't even remember, and there was um, some exchanges in Japanese and she burst out laughing or she made a comment and I asked her how did she know Japanese? And she sort of started talking that it had been what she had done a little bit during the war. But as always, as soon as you probed, she would stop talking about it. Lo and behold, I go down to Mappen and I find her name. Sheila Bell Isabel Mappen. wrote for her mother's war records. They were so cryptic, they were hard to understand. Pembroke 5. And in my little research, I knew then that that was a code for Bletchley. But it became clear she had led a group of 15 Canadian women working in Bletchley, they had met Alan Turing. It wasn't until 2009 that those who did this code work were recognized with medals. By then, many were gone, but it arrived in time for Isabel's mother. I think that's what made a difference in her deciding to talk about it. It says, we also served. And that is what became important to her, that the world might sound a bit pretentious, but at least others would know that they also served. But even the women themselves have sometimes needed encouragement to realize what they did mattered. And that's you? Yeah, this is our kitchen. Mary Owen almost had to be goaded into filling out the paperwork for her medal. It took me so long to, to get that medal because I didn't think I was worth it. Really? Yeah. Lest she still doubt, Mary Owen and her work mattered. This is what we wore, keep warm. She was sent to the southernmost point of Nova Scotia, well, Vaccaro, to operate what was called a Loran machine. That stands for, for long range navigation? Right on. We had um, a generator mm -hmm. and we sent out a signal. The ships and the airplanes would take a reading and then they would know exactly where they were stationed. Okay. on the ocean or in the air. So this was all navigation? This was all it was navigation. all navigation. That's all we did. Was, And we were never to tell anybody what we did. That was the big secret. This is the Loran, and this is where we kept track of the signals. Secret because the Loran machine allowed Allied forces to navigate without voice or radio contact, critical for D-Day. They had put Loran on a lot of the ships that were going over, taking the troops over to France. The weather was so bad that they wouldn't have got over if it hadn't been for Loran. A machine so crucial, the Wrens at Baccarat were under order to protect the station against possible German threats. You had a fair amount of weaponry there. We did, we did. We had dynamite. We had Bren guns, we had Sen guns, and we had, we had uh, rifles, which none of us could lift. So wh what was the plan for all that weaponry? The story was shoot, set the dynamite, and then run like hell. You were going to blow the Quonset hut. We if were you were blow threatened, that, blow the whole thing up. Blow the whole thing up, and then run down the road. Because the intelligence inside was that secret, that, yeah. that important. Yeah. There are the few pictures left, the stories that get softer around the edges with time, but the feelings, those are as raw now as they ever were. So how old were you when, when the idea of enlisting just started to be a buzz conversation in your world? 
Oh, probably when all the boys were leaving. Can you imagine a memory so fresh, so acute, that 70 years later, it can haunt like that? You never did any of this without thinking of the guy on the beaches. Do you think it cost the Wrens, I mean, in, in the sense of recognition for what they did? Do you think that the idea that so many secrets were held for so long, people didn't get their due? It's a fact of war. Do you know there were people who jumped over into the enemy lines, who were taken prisoner, or who came back having been there and spied, and they never got compensated either. This is Elsa Lassard. Now they agree on behalf of the veterans of the Rosby Navy and the Roman women's. The Rome women have always been there, you know. On and on and on and on. So women have always been there for the men during war. And the thank yous have sometimes been a long time coming. But even now, or perhaps especially now, while the likes of Elsa are still able to soak them in, they matter. <laughs>